at least for them. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another online causal inference seminar. We are happy to have to, to have here today Christina Yu from Cornell University, who will talk to us about exploiting neighborhood interference with low order interactions under uni randomized design. The discussion today is Chen Cheng Chai from Temple University. We do have two people uh, on Q&A, Mylene and Matt, so um, Dominic will explain to you how you can ask questions during the talk. Yeah, so questions uh, work as usual. Uh, please submit your questions via Q&A. Most of them will probably be handled by our Q&A moderators, but some of them we will bring directly to Christina so we can discuss them in person. If we uh, unmute you, please keep in mind that the talk will be recorded and probably uploaded to the internet. Thank you. Uh, with, not, without further ado, uh, let's hand over to uh, Christina. Great. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much. Um, you guys can see my screen now, right? Yes. Perfect. All right. So um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to uh, be here today and share this work with you. Um, this is a really new work, so we we're really uh, eager to get any feedback that you may have. So um, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so our motivating uh, example that um, I'll get, I will use is suppose I am a social media platform um, that wants to evaluate some new algorithm for ranking items on their newsfeed. So uh, a naive thing to do would be to randomly assign a fraction of the users to the new algorithm and compare performance in terms of, for example, metric of uh, the user interaction on uh, between the users that get the new algorithm versus users that have the status quo. But uh, an issue that arises is that, is that the individual's behavior on social media platforms have influence on each other. So if I was placed in the control group, but my friend was placed in the treatment group, my friend having access to this new feature might be generating new content that will show up on my news feed such that I actually receive a different experience than if I was uh, in the status quo universe. So, so this is kind of um, um, the kind of one example we were used to motivate network interference, which will be the main topic of our talk today. So we'll uh, assume a, um, a potential outcomes framework. So our goal is going to estimate be to estimate the causal effect of a proposed treatment versus control on a, a fixed size population of size n, which is connected via some network. And uh, we'll use y to denote the potential outcomes function, which will specify all hypothetical outcomes. So here is a function that maps from uh, a treatment vector of zero ones on the entire population to outcomes over the entire population. And the causal estimate we'll focus on today is the total treatment effect. The total treatment effect is the difference between the average outcomes of, in, of, individual, of individuals under uh, the setting where all individuals get treatment, that's this bold uh, vector one, versus the setting where all individuals get control, that's this bold vector zero. Um, and the challenge is that we're only going to observe data from a single treatment vector um, that comes from running a randomized experiment. And this treatment that is uh, it, that, that you're allowed to use during the experiment is often budgeted. For example, you should think of the treatment fraction P to be something significantly smaller than one half. Uh, so a quick comment here, I think uh, our, our results will extend beyond total treatment effect, but one, one motivating reason for um, considering the total treatment effect is that um, for a company, for example, our social media company, at the end of the experiment, they're trying to decide whether or not to adopt the new algorithm for everyone. So that would implement this new algorithm widely, universally, or to, to kind of continue using their status quo algorithm. So at the end of the day, they're really looking for estimating the outcomes under this all ones vector versus all zeros vector. Um, okay. And the key assumptions we'll be using today is the neighborhood interference. We all wanna contrast that with the classical assumption of the stable unit treatment value assumption, which in which an individual's outcome only depends on the individual's own treatment that allows us to reduce the potential outcomes function to only depend on a single binary uh, value indicating whether this individual I was placed in treatment or control. In contrast, the neighborhood interference assumption imposes that individual's outcome only depends on the treatment of its neighborhood, where the neighborhood is going to be denoted with this script N uh, notation here. So in particular, this implies that um, the potential outcomes of individual I is going to be the same under two vectors, under two treatment vectors Z and Z prime, if the assignment of treatment to the neighborhood of I is the same in these two vectors. 
uh, it's equivalent to saying that we can reduce the complexity of this potential outcomes function to only depend on the treatment assignments uh, to the individual's neighborhood. And here you should think of the neighborhood as um, being defined by the set of individuals whose treatment assignment could in affect individualized outcome. In particular, um, you should think of this neighborhood script N as including individual I itself. Um, we will primarily stick with the randomized experiment setting uh, where we are randomizing the treatments to avoid confounding. And we'll use randomized design to refer to the, the distribution of the treatment vector. We'll allow for some additive observation noise uh, where this epsilon I is going to be assumed to be independent and uh, mean zero Gaussian. All right, so um, in, the, in the standard setting, when we do have a uh, stable unit treatment value assumption, a very classic way to uh, estimate the, the, the causal effect is to run an A-B test, in which I randomly assign this individual I uh, to treatment or control. Um, and if I assign them to treatment, I get some noisy observation that's an unbiased estimate of their outcome under treatment. Otherwise, I get a again an unbiased estimate of their outcome under control. Um, if my goal is to estimate the total treatment effect, you can see that uh, a natural estimator to use would be the difference in means estimator, in which I simply take the difference of the mean observation under the, the treatment group minus the mean observation of individuals in the control group. And the kind of properties of the difference in means estimator and why it's a, a particularly well-motivated one in this setting really relies on the SUVA assumption as well as the randomization. But now when we have inter network interference, you should think of a setting where this individual I's outcome depends on the treatment assigned to all of its neighborhoods. Again, the treatment effect now, this estimate, uh, the, the total treatment effect that we're trying to estimate is the difference between uh, the outcomes under one hypothetical universe in which all individuals are placed in treatment versus another hypothetical universe in which all individuals are placed in control. However, the, the data that we actually collect from a simple A-B test, uh, again, uh, independently randomizes over individual's I to treatment and control such that the observation you collect is going to be an unbiased estimate of the outcome of this individual under whatever happened to be the treatment configuration of its neighborhood. In particular, if the treatment configuration of its neighborhood is neither fully treatment or fully control, it's not clear how this observation even relates to these two quantities um, that are in our estimate. So when you naively use difference of means estimator, it's easy to construct settings in which it incurs significant bias. Um, and so the key question is, how do we use data from our A-B test to estimate the total treatment effect under interference? And again, we're going to be uh, sticking with this setting in which um, we are doing unit randomized design. So we're randomizing individually over, indi uh, over people in our population. And we'll comment on the significance of that in a moment. Okay, so let me give a, a very brief uh, um, overview of the literature here. Um, this is actually uh, an extremely active area. So the, uh, there's definitely going to be some works that I'm um, um, that are not uh, on, on our slides, but I hope this gives you an idea of the kind of categories and how I think about it. Um, so the design of an experiment consists of two components. First, I have to decide what's my randomized design. So what's the distribution I use for assigning treatment and control? So there's a whole set of works that thinks about, you know, how do we change the way we do randomized design to address network interference? The second piece is thinking about the estimator I use. So what's the method I use to process data that's collected from the experiment? And there's a whole set of works, that, again, that also look at how do I um, think about you know, using a different estimator to uh, address network interference. So you can think of the literature as um, kind of organized along these two axes. The x-axis denotes the model structure. The y-axis denotes the graph structure, um, where large values indicate you know, you're looking at more fully general settings and small values would indicate more structured settings. So if I don't want to impose any assumptions on either the graph or the model, one simple thing I must, might try first would be to look at the Horvath-Thompson estimator under Bernoulli design. Um, the Horvath-Thompson estimator looks like the following, where here I'm just looking at, uh, again, the, the, this first is the indicator function of myself and my neighborhood assigned to treatment divided by the probability of that event. 
minus the indicator function of myself and my neighborhood assigned to control divided by the probability of that event. And under a Bernoulli randomized design, these probabilities, again, um, are simply just products of the individual probabilities of assignments. And what that means is that the variance of this estimator, so this estimator is clearly unbiased by construction, the variance of this estimator scales exponentially in the degree of the graph. And this exponential um, dependence comes from the fact that these probabilities are exponentially small. Um, so one thing we could do is to ask, if I had very strong structure on my graph, could we do better? So in particular, if I assume um, a, dis the, a partial interference, which refers to a setting where the, the graph can be um, split into disconnected subcommunities, it's also called the kind of multiple networks assumption. Um, then under this setting, you can think about randomize over each of these subcommunities separately. Um, and, and then applying, um, you know, a, a more, uh, a Hor the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. Um, in this setting, if, you know, if you look at the variance of it, the variance will now depend on the number of communities. And that's, uh, that's kind of natural because you're randomizing now at the community level. Um, uh, I think another very beautiful set of works looks at if I have um, more general graphs that are not necessarily disconnected. Um, but they have some kind of uh, restricted growth property. So ideally, they're still somewhat clusterable. What I could do is actually construct clusters. So here, for example, I can choose some cluster centers, assign individuals to their nearest cluster center. Now with these constructed clusters, I can randomize over the clusters jointly. Um, and that what that does is that kind of um, increases a correlation that my, myself and my neighbors are assigned to the same either treatment or control. Again, that helps to boost that probability that shows up in the Horvath Thompson estimator. And indeed, you can get a uh, very, very nice uh, variance um, uh, scaling. So here you, you, in particular, if you contrast this with um, a, a simple Bernoulli design, you go from exponential dependence on the degree to just polynomial dependence on the degree. Now, limitation of these uh, approaches is that they do require um, these more fancy cluster randomized designs which may require you to uh, completely you know, re-implement your experimentation platform to support it. So another, uh, again, the other axis is looking at you know, a set of works that imposes um, exploits model structure. So the simplest model structure we can think about uh, exploiting is linear models. So this is an uh, assumption that my potential outcomes is a linear functional of you know, whether or not I'm treated or not. So, so alpha is the baseline, beta is my direct effect. And, and this phi is a function of my neighborhood treatment. So you should think of phi, typically um, what is chosen, it's chosen to be the fraction of neighbors treated or the number of neighbors treated. So you should think of your potential outcomes function being a linear function of your number of neighbors treated. And, and now my goal is to just to learn alpha, beta, and gamma. This phi function is assumed to be known. Um, one thing I want to comment is that, um, that there is an, a, a new type of kind of confoundedness that comes, arises in, in, um, in, due to the network interference in which if I had a model in which, um, let's say under low degree individuals and high degree individuals, there was actually a different linear function that I was supposed to fit. If I fit a single joint function to this data, um, there may be confounding that comes from the fact that this phi function is correlated um, to you know, whether I'm a low degree individual or high degree individual. Um, so there is actually a, a somewhat of a strong assumption imposed on um, that you really do need that this, um, all the heterogeneity really should be captured in the way this phi and you know, it, it, uh, in this phi function. So this kind of um, approaches can be extended beyond linear models to more, to richer parametric models. Again, the, the idea is the same in that I just want to re reduce it to something like regression. It doesn't have to be linear regression. It I can look at other kinds of functional forms. So this fu function f doesn't need to be linear, but it, no, I do need to assume that my model truly, my potential outcomes model truly satisfies uh, this, mo this, this um, uh, uh, model structure. Uh, it does typically require what's called anonymous interference, which means that this phi function is usually only a function of the number of treated individuals and not the identities. Um, and it practically does require feature engineering in terms of this choice of this function phi. So 
And, and I guess one more common, there's one kind of class of, of uh, works that actually foregoes getting unbiased estimators and just looks at, you know, if I, if I restrict myself to a particular application, can I use domo domain specific structure to reduce the bias of, an, uh, of, of these um, simple estimators using experimental design or, um, or, or by constructing an estimator? And the starting point of our work was thinking about you know, here, there's on the bottom side here, there's a set of models and structure which really impose something I think is quite strong because it allows you to reduce your estimation task to regression. Uh, in particular, the unknown degrees of freedom uh, cannot scale with my population size. Uh, versus on the right, I have a fully general model. And is there a way to extrapolate between these two? So here, we're going to propose a new hierarchy of uh, models. Well, that that is where the complexity is characterized by the the degree of interaction. So we call these low order interaction models, and we propose um, the pseudo inverse estimator under this model class, uh, and we analyze it under Bernoulli design and show that the variance uh, looks like this. So in particular, you should think of when beta is fully general, then it's going to be equal to the degree of the graph. So we have exponential dependence on the degree, which would match really what you 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 would cover the Harvest Thompson estimator. Uh, when beta is when when our model is linear, beta is equal to one, uh, and so then you get you know uh, n p in the in the uh, denominator, which uh, is really nice. <laughs> so in in some ways, you can think that this this um, this model complexity parameter beta is going to govern the um, the strength of or the the variance of the estimator. Um, so there's a natural kind of it introduces a natural trade off between. The, the structure you impose on the model and the uh, kind of complexity of estimation. Okay, so I, I, last I wanted to highlight two other um, works that I'm not gonna talk about, but um, uh, that I've also worked on. Um, and so in under the lower interaction setting, uh, we also were thinking about how do we um, come up with solutions that do not require knowledge of the network and so these are two of our papers that um, essentially relax the requirement on the knowledge of the network when you have richer measurements. Um, and, and this is a paper looking at if you have extremely rich measurements, then you can even estimate individual causal effects. Okay. So let me take a pause here. I imagine you guys will tell me if there's any uh, questions. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you. No question yet. I just wanted to ask maybe that you're going to talk about it later, but like, is there some like optimality kind of guarantee that you have for that? Yes, for that there segment? will be optimality guarantees. They'll be tight in one in some sense and loose in some sense. So yeah. I'll point it out. Anyway. Great. So let's dive into the model. Um, so uh, sorry. So first here, I'm just going to show you how we started thinking about this uh, this model structure. First of all, you can see that uh, this is, I'm not making any assumptions here. Under a fully general neighborhood interference assumption, I can write my potential outcomes as um, you know, a sum over all subsets of my neighborhood of the outcome that uh, my potential outcome, so A, A oh sorry, A is going to be the my, my outcome under that particular set of neighbors being treated times the indicator function. So again, these indicator functions just pick out one of these outcomes because they're all disjoint. Now, next, I can see that uh, I can take this indicator function and express it as a polynomial function in Z just by multiplying uh, either Z or one minus Z if it's treated or not treated. And now, uh, once I can write it in this polynomial form, I expand this product and write it in a monomial basis as this is just for simplicity for us later. So here, again, all we're just saying is that without loss of generality, I can write every potential outcomes function as a polynomial in these treatment variables Z. Uh, this term here, I'm going to just refer this coefficient on top of this monomial, I'm just going to refer to as this coefficient C. And now we, now we can say that if every potential outcomes function can be written as a polynomial, well, we know a very natural way to measure the complexity of a polynomial. That's the degree of the polynomial. So the degree of a general, uh, sorry, of a, yeah, the, the polynomial degree of a general potential outcomes function under neighborhood interference is upper bounded by the size of the neighborhood. That's because again, um, this sum is only over sets of this, where the size of the set is restricted to 
you know, the neighborhood. But now the key idea that really was, I think runs through our entire set of works is looking at, well, is it true then that models with lower polynomial degree can be simpler to estimate? And can we actually show that formally? Uh, and ideally what you'd want to now is then again, a set of estimators that also um, kind of span the spectrum from complex high degree, high, high degree meaning the degree can be as large as the degree of the graph, uh, as opposed to low degree where the degree of the polynomial could be significantly smaller than the de degree of the graph. So in that um, setting, we, so we're assuming that the polynomial has low degree. We will refer to this as low order interactions. The reason being that um, these polynomials are polynomials over binary variables. And so it's when you think of low degree, it's not the kind of a, you shouldn't think of a polynomial with squiggly lines, right? So it's uh you should think of it's a binary, it's a polynomial over binary variables. So the degree is actually governed by um what's the constraint on the size of the set of these binary variables that interact to produce a network effect. Right. So here is the form that we're going to be using for most of our um uh the rest of the, the talk, where we'll assume that the potential outcomes function can be written in this way as a sum over all sets that are subsets of my neighborhood where the size of that subset is less than or equal to beta, uh, where beta again is the complexity, is governing the complexity of our model. Uh, and then you have the monomial, which corresponds to all of the individuals in that set being treated times the coefficient, corresponding coefficient, which is the network effect arising from this set of individuals being treated. Okay, so this is equivalent to, um, to saying that these coefficients, so this uh, uh, kind of have this particular form. And what I all, the only thing I want to comment is that um, you can actually write this model purely in terms of assumptions on the potential outcomes um, itself. So these are potential outcomes where this set T is treated and everyone is not treated. Um, it comes exactly from this equivalence here between the monomial basis and the um, and the representation where you're using indicator functions. Um, and the 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 low degree um, assumption is implying that this uh, expression for larger sets has to take value zero. So when beta is equal to one, it's a particularly um, nice setting which actually has been studied before. It, it's exactly equivalent to what's called the joint assumptions of the additivity of main effects and interaction effects that appeared previously in the paper by Sussman and Errol D. It's also referred to as the heterogeneous additive network effects model. Um, so I, I wanna give a little bit of intuition about particularly this beta equals one setting. Um, so I guess, as I mentioned, it's equivalent to these two assumptions put together. The additivity of main effects assumes that um, my potential outcomes uh, is going to be equal to the baseline effect plus a direct effect of myself being treated. So ZI being treated and everyone being under control uh, plus the, inter the effect of the interaction of my neighborhood treatments. And the additivity of interaction effects is just stating that this neighborhood treatment effects can be decomposed into a sum over each of the individual neighbors themselves. And each of these terms now come exactly pop up in our model here. So this, this, uh, these two assumptions together that have been uh, introduced, in fact, exactly recover the, the model that we propose when beta equals one. This model also, you can, um, you can think of the model as, uh, as being represented in this way where um, alpha is our baseline parameters. This matrix here has all of the direct effects in green on the diagonal and all the off-diagonal entries are going to be your network effects CIK. You can represent in a graph here where again, alpha is going to be the baseline effects on the nodes. The edges rep represent the, uh, say the self loops represent the direct effects of myself being treated on myself. Uh, the edges that point from let's say five to three is the effect of individual five being treated on individual three's outcome. And if I color individuals red, it means they're treated and I color their edges, the out, outgoing edges red, meaning that if individual five is treated, the outgoing edges are kind of activated and this, the, the measured um, potential outcome of individual is going to be the sum of their, their baseline effect plus the sum of the weights of the red edges that are pointing in. 
So it's just a visual way to represent the model as well. Something nice about this model is that um, these, you know, these these coefficients are arbitrarily and allowed to be unit specific, um, so that the number of parameters in my model is again one parameter for every node and and one parameter for every edge. That is larger than the number of measurements because I only get one measurement per node. And this generalizes a lot of the linear models that are used empirically without needing to do a feature engineering. So in particular, I don't have to decide whether um, uh, the feature is, you know, the, the fraction of treated neighbors or the number of treated neighbors. I can also allow for, you know, different neighbors that have different weights in terms of their effect on me. Um, I did want to give a few examples of why should we care about this model beyond beta equals one. Um, so if I have a setting in which, say, my local, this is my local neighborhood, uh, if my local neighborhood is going to, is partitioned into sub-communities, so these are my friends from college, these are my family, this is my colleagues, um, and if my network effects are additive across sub-communities, then the degree is going to be at most the size of the largest sub-community. Um, suppose another example would be, say, I have a social media platform that's testing a hangout room feature. And this hangout room feature is limited to groups of size smaller than five. Then again, this would be because of the constraint on the group size, the network effects only arise from groups of size five. Another setting could be where the potential outcomes function could be a polynomial function of a linear combination of your um, neighborhood treatments. And the, the degree of this polynomial function would then govern the de degree of the, um, the polynomial degree of the, the model at large. And another example would be setting where the network effects say arise from only pairwise or triangular interactions in the network. So the triangle interactions would then introduce a degree three. Okay, so I'll pause here. That was the model. Any questions about this low, um, the low order interactions assumption? Thanks. I, I don't think we have currently questions in Q&A. So there, this is just an encouragement for everyone. Please, if you have questions, submit them via q and I have a quick one for Christina. So in practice, I guess if you if you fit these models, you could you could just try and see what happens like across several betas. And at some point, hopefully kind of your estimator will stabilize. I mean, do you have an indication like at which point things kind of stabilize? Yeah, like two, three, that would be super interesting. We um, one, we have not yet uh, had an opportunity to to really work with real um, real world data on this estimator yet. Mm -hmm. um, two is that I think the we have limited understanding of model misspecification right now, um, and so I think that there would need to be a little bit more work in in, in thinking more carefully about um, how to tune and choose beta if you didn't know it. Great, thanks. I think there just there's a question right now, a clarification question. Yeah. Uh, what are triangular interactions? Um, ah, um, so I meant to say if if uh, if I am connected, to, if I let's say I have two friends that are connected to each other, then if there are network effects that only arise from these kinds of uh, uh, from from these triangles in the network. So the triangle would be the fact that I have an edge to two friends, and those two friends have edges to each other. Awesome, thanks. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Um, let's continue. So, so uh all right, so so the kind of overall agenda is thinking about how do we exploit lower order interactions. We'll present some new estimators where the performance is characterized by this polynomial degree. And today we're just going to focus on bullet point one. So we're looking at the under Bernoulli design, so the classical experiment setup. Uh, you know, how do we can come up with estimators for that? I did want to comment, we have these two other papers um, that look at more richer experimental settings, a staggered rollout design where you can take multiple measurements over time in your experiment. Um, and under these richer experimental settings, you're actually able to get graphic agnostic estimators that don't actually require knowledge of the network. But um, I put them here if you're interested, um, but we're gonna really focus on the first one today. So we'll first start by giving intuition in the linear model setting. So think of beta equals one. So again, we're in a uh, we have a non-uniform Bernoulli design setting where each individual J is treated independently with probability PJ. Um, the again, the treatments act on outgoing edges. So you should think of if individuals treated, their outgoing edges are colored red. It's equivalent to select, selecting columns of the matrix, uh, and the measurements are on incoming edges. So the measurement when I measure a potential outcome 
that's going to be the sum of the red incoming edges. It, it's equivalent to the row sums of the selected columns. So you should think of this picture to kind of give you a sense of what are what is the effect of treatment and what is the measurement. And what I want to estimate is the total treatment effect. The total treatment effect will be the sum of all the, or the, yeah, the sum of all the edges, the weights of edges in the network, uh, or it's equivalent to the sum of all the entries in this matrix. So we will uh, propose the pseudo inference estimator. In fact, I'll comment later that this estimator actually arose. Is it, we 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 came we actually derived it ourselves, but then we discovered that um, this estimator was already in the literature uh, and in a very different context. So in that different context, it was called pseudo inverse estimator. So we are just gonna use their name. Um, so so first to build intuition, just focus on a single node i. So I have a single node i. And it's it's a potential outcomes model has this form in the linear setting. Suppose I had samples, so this is a hypothetical world, from m different independent replications of the experiment. Obviously, we don't, but we'll just run with it for now. If I did, then because of the linear structure in this representation here, the estimation reduces to ordinary least squares, right? So here I here are my measurements from m different replications. Here are my treatment vectors for um, m different applications. This is the unknown coefficient vector I want to estimate, and these are my noise terms. So the number of covariates in this um, model would be the the my the size of my neighborhood plus one, uh, and you know that's the, again also the same as the number of unknown co co coefficients I want to estimate. So if I refer to this vector as y tilde, this covariate matrix as x and this unknown um, coefficient vector as W, then, um, and uh, here I'm going to refer to a single um, row here. So that's gonna be um, uh, the, I guess, co co covariates for a particular run of my experiment as E tilde. Then you can write an estimate for my uh, coefficient vector W hat using, this is just the OLS estimator, right? And uh, in fact, you can see that these, these um, terms inside uh, this x transpose x is in fact approximating this expectation. Uh, and this x transpose y is approximating this expectation. And this expectation actually is fully known to us because it's only a function of the randomized design. We know the randomized design. We can, I mean, it's Bernoulli randomized design, right? So it, because it's Bernoulli randomized design, this matrix here is actually invertible. Uh, whoops, sorry. So this this second term here, this expectation, we don't know this expectation because we don't know the potential outcomes function. But what we can do is say that, well, I can construct an unbiased estimate by simply replacing this expectation with the empirical value itself. Now you can see that this then is clearly unbiased because all I did was replace this one with uh, a single sample and this single sample is unbiased. This matrix again is a known function of the randomized design. Then the next thing you want to observe is that the total treatment effect is actually a linear functional of these co coefficient uh, vectors w. So these coefficient vector, this coefficient vector w. So I'll, let me just flip back so you see it. Is the unknown coefficients that govern our potential outcomes model, like these alphas and the c terms. And the total treatment effect is, in fact, you can you know write that it's actually just a, a sum of these c terms and averaged by one over n. And so in fact, this total treatment effect is a linear function of this W where the linear functional corresponds to this vector theta where I zero out the, the baseline effect and I uniformly weight all the other effects. So then a natural estimator to do is to say, well, I can construct an unbiased estimate of W, just that my W hat. And I my estimate is a linear functional of W. So I'm just gonna estimate total treatment effect by plugging in W hat for W here. And the nice thing is because my total treatment effect was an average anyways, then it, the estimate also has an average in here so that even though a single estimate of my, um, of this W hat is actually, you know, has very high variance, when I average them overall N, then this one will, this final estimator will actually behave well. Okay. So uh, this is a summary of the estimator. Um, one comment is that this, this um, W hats across different eyes, so across different individuals' eye, 
Uh, they are actually going to be correlated because um, these W hats are a function of um, my neighborhood treatment and my observation. And so if we have um, shared neighbors, then these W hats will be correlated. And the approach is, about, and, and I did want to comment, this approach is not specific to the total treatment effect or Bernoulli randomized design in that you can extend it uh, to you know, other, any other linear estimator, estimand or uh, other, other randomized designs as long as you can um, think about the implications towards this matrix here. Um, so this is the same idea as a pseudo inverse, oh yeah, as a pseudo inverse estimator uh, used in a, a, a very different machine learning setting. Um, their analysis was a little easier than ours because they don't have the extra correlation from the network interference so that their W hats are actually independent across I. So that was the additional thing we had to handle in the analysis as well. And I did mention, yeah, that there are natural extensions. Okay, so here, let me just show that we can actually um, uh, get an analytical expression for this estimator under Bernoulli randomized design. We can take this, um, again, this expected matrix ZZ transpose, it has this form, I can compute the inverse, it has this form, you don't need to look at the math, <laughs> and you plug in and you get this final estimator. Um, and here, I'll show it here. So here, this is the final estimator we get for uh, beta equals one setting. Uh, this term here, you can see it looks very similar to kind of um, the inverse probability weighted estimator, right? Uh, but except for the weird thing is that I'm multiplying I's observation with the sum over all my neighbors, J, of this term here. So in particular, um, my observation is multiplied by this term for other neighbors as well. So by, so we constructed, by construction, the estimator is in, indeed unbiased. Uh, the variance has this following form. So in particular, when beta equals one, it has, you know, the dependence on, uh, it is kind of this one over NP that we expect. When the p's are uniform, it actually um, there's another narrative for explaining this estimator um, that that actually um, can be interpreted as a certain way of, of uh, a Horvitz-Thompson as well. So that appeared in this paper here. Um, and and if the so so actually the way we derived it was not actually inverting the the matrix, but we derived it by directly um, solving for these unbiases equations in that if I plug in the the this yi with my potential outcomes model, I can see that to get my estimator to be unbiased, I want this expectation of this term to be zero, which is um, satisfied because of this uh, the form of these um, inner terms. And I also want the expectation of this term if I multiply it by zi to be equals to one. And again, this is true because of the, it, it does hinge on the independence that is um, in the Bernoulli randomized design. Um, and similarly, this expectation of this, this expression multiplied by ZK for any neighbor K is also equal to one. Um, okay, so let me take a quick breath. Um, next, I'll tell you how um, this generalizes to general beta beyond one. It's actually the exact same idea. The only comment is that now I can take my uh, potential outcomes function and now write it as a linear functional of, uh, of modified features here. So here, now it's a linear functional of these product of my treatment variables O, Z, S, where I'm now like summing over all subsets S of size up to beta. Um, now you can run through the exact same narrative, use OLS to now um, kind of derive your estimator. Number of, uh, the number of um, these unknown coefficients that you're estimating, i.e. the same as the number of covariates, is going to be the number of subsets of size at most beta in your neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, know, suppose you have like lots of different treatment vectors that are maybe, at most the number of different treatment vectors you can measure is two to the N. Um, you can see, actually, if you run through this narrative, you can also see that if I choose beta equal to the, the size of the neighborhood itself, then I can rewrite this whole um, formulation to just have an, an identity matrix here so that you can um, recover the Horvitz-Thompson estimator as well. Okay, so you can run through the exact same narrative. Um, again, you construct unbiased estimates for these W hats. Again, use the fact that it's a estimate is linear functional of these Ws, and you estimate by averaging um, these uh, estimates across units. So that results in the final estimator for the general beta setting. 
Um, it looks, again, similar to the form we had earlier. Now it's slightly more complex in that we have to sum over all subsets of a certain of size up to beta, and you have to multiply it by this um, function g. This function g, either you can think of it as coming out of inverting that matrix, or you can think of this g function g as uh, coming out of solving for unbiasedness conditions. And the variance now we can show is uh, scales as has the primary uh, scaling of one over n times p to the beta, where beta again is that um, uh, the degree polynomial degree of the model. So uh, earlier Dominic asked about uh, about optimality. So here I'm going to comment on it in a moment. So you can ask, is this is this um, is this optimal? So in fact, we actually can construct a lower bound for a setting where, say, I have a deregular graph, I have uniform treatment probabilities p, then you can, uh, and again, we're doing Bernoulli randomized design. Uh, for any estimator, given this data, the mean squared error of, the, the, of estimating the total treatment effect is bounded below by this form. Um, in particular, the thing you should notice is that on this side, we do get this d to the beta over p to the beta. That's we have a p to the beta here. There's the there we have exponential d to the beta in the in the numerator. It's not quite tight in that this probably should be well. This is d to the two beta. That's d to the beta. But it does suggest that this exponential dependence on beta is in fact um, necessary. Uh, this is referring to the fact that if mm, if my treatment probability is very very smart sparse, then the first term will will be the limiting one. So if if my um, expected number of treated neighbors is like less than one. So if, if the budget is so small that actually there's many individuals in my network that actually don't get any neighbor that's treated or not, then at all, then the first term is gonna dominate. And then in that setting, our result is closer to tight in that we have this P to the beta times N in the denominator and a D to the two beta in the numerator. Um, in the setting where uh, P is a little bit larger, so mm, we, our treatment budget is larger, then our lower bound does not depend on the degree D. So it's unclear whether, you know, maybe there can be some improvement there. Okay. And the construction for this instance is based on uh, constructing instances where the, um, where for sets of size beta, the network effect is either plus delta or minus delta uh, divided by the number of sets of that size. Okay. Mm. So I did want to comment on some implications that this uh, our results have for observational studies. Uh, first of all, our estimator is unbiased for this non-uniform Bernoulli design setting. And what that means is that if I have a setting, for example, where the probabilities of adopting a treatment, they may not be randomly, randomly assigned, but they are conditionally independent given observed covariates. So we have some kind of uh, unconfoundedness. Then we, and if we're in a setting where we can presumably estimate these probabilities, so now you should think of these PJs to be functions of, um, like where the heterogeneity is purely governed by known covariates of individual J. Then you can estimate these PJs and plug it into the estimator, and you would get some um, uh, translation of our results to an observational study setting. Uh, I think there's a lot of very interesting questions for how to kind of formalize these extensions to the observational studies and what would it mean um, to relax, you know, to be able to deal with the uh, confoundedness as well. Uh, one, one concrete setting where, you know, it is clearer to say that, our, uh, see the extensions would be in a, the non-compliance study, setting studied by De Chaglia et al., um, where they assume that say treatments are still, uh, there's randomness in assigning whether individuals are offered a treatment or not, but they have to choose to uh, accept the treatment or to actually comply. And uh, in that way, you um, can kind of argue that, that uh, if, the, yeah, if the, that, that this kind of um, um, condition can be satisfied so that you're really just, these PJs are going to be the product of whether you offered the treatment and whether the individual accepted the treatment. Okay, so I'll wrap it up with um, um, a few synthetic experiment. Uh, well, one ex the synthetic experiment we did with an erdos rennie graph that has expected degree of 10. Um, our potential outcomes function is a polynomial of uh, a linear functional of the treatments. Um, 
we we choose a beta degree model such that and this parameter r is going to govern the average ratio of the network effect to the direct effect and um, we again do Bernoulli p randomized design and we benchmark against uh, ordinary least squares and difference in these um, so our estimator is the one in blue so it's it is indeed the only one that's unbiased uh, because the other other um, the other models don't account for the heterogeneity that it does uh, the heterogeneity in our model. So in particular here, I should comment, right? These parameters, alpha, w, ij, they're individual to individual, they're, they're individualized to the unit, so, uh, to the person so that um, you cannot fit a single global polynomial model. Um, so that sense, we are unbiased, but we do, you know, I think here we are in a setting in which um, even though we have slightly larger variance, that reduction in biases actually um, um, kind of results in a better estimator. This is actually just in the beta equals one setting, in the beta equals two setting. Of course, the variance uh, increases as well, but the bias of the other estimators also increase. Um, okay, so in conclusion, we propose uh, pseudo inverse estimators that exploit the structure of potential outcomes model to estimate the total treatment effect under network interference. Um, we can, this, this framework can be used to derive estimators for other linear estimates and randomized designs as well, which we think is an interesting uh, thing to explore. Uh, the complexity of estimation is governed by the polynomial degree of the model, uh, and there are interesting implications to unconfounded settings of observational studies. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting open questions of how should we choose this model parameter beta if we don't know it? Um, can we actually optimize the randomized design for this estimator? Um, could we, is there any way of using tools um, that people have already studied a lot to look at unconfoundedness, but in um, our context? So with that, I'm happy to uh, conclude. Thank you, Christina. Uh, so since we don't have any questions right now, I think that it's a good time to switch to discussion. Uh, and hopefully the audience, if they have questions on Christina's talk, please feel free to uh, ask via the Q&A and we can get back to that if we have time after the discussion. So Chen Cheng, if you would like to share your slides, I think we can uh, go on with that for now. Sure. So um, thank Christina for this excellent talk. So here for, for the discussion part, I'll just add a, a piece of background in the interference and a piece of intuition about why the pseudo-inverse estimator outperforms uh, the other estimators in the simulation part. So we start from the interference. The definition is simple. So basically one unit's treatment affects another unit's outcome. That kind of a phenomenon is called interference. But we usually, assume that the interference is, uh, comes from the first order neighbors. But you may ask why we do not consider second order neighbors. Second order neighbors basically means uh, it's neighbors, neighbors. But if it depends on the second order neighbor, you can just add an edge uh, for, for the unit to its second order neighbor, then you, you have a new graph. And in the new graph, you only have a first order neighbor interference in, in that case. So that's why we usually study the first order neighbors here. And in this interference structure, we simply write the, the uh, potential outcome as a function of the treatment assignment within this neighbor set. So there are several existing uh, potential outcome assumptions. So some simplified one, one is depending on the number of treated neighbors. You take a summation of all the uh, assigned treatment around your neighbors, then you get the two, two parameter model here. Or it can be depends on the, uh, sorry, here typo, it should be uh, the proportion proportion of treated neighbors. So you get the total number of treated in your neighbor and you divide by the total size of the neighbor, you get a proportion between zero and one here. And uh, here, Christina's talk uh, is a kind of um, adding more parameters, adding more flexibility to the previous two assumptions here. They consider the truncated inter interaction of, uh, of the assignments of this uh, neighbor set. So let's consider the total treatment effect. So it's basically about the difference between everyone treated versus everyone control. So here we just assume a, a, a very special case. This is not always true for, for the real data. We assume that this expected uh, potential outcome is, some, is a monotone function with respect to this uh, treatment, uh, this assignment vector in the uh, in the neighbor set. 
So basically, then we, we have a smallest value when, when the whole neighbor is controlled, and we have the largest value when the whole neighbor is, is uh, treated, and you get some value between these two edges, between two these extremes, if you have some uh, other treated for the neighbors. Then you can imagine, you if you cannot deal with the samples within the middle range here, you will definitely underestimate the total treatment effect because the effect is defined by the difference between the smallest number here and the, the largest number here. So we, we keep this inequality here. This is our uh, assumption. This is not necessarily true for all data set. So a, a few estimators, like the difference in mean estimator, we consider it as a non-parametric estimator because it does not assume any parametric linear model for the potential outcome. So one naive difference, difference in mean estimate, it just compare the average uh, observed outcome for treated versus uh, the average observed outcome for control. You, you can find that the units in a control, in a treated and control, the, the units in the middle region are also included. So this kind of estimator can be a biased, it can be a biased estimator because uh, because the units from the middle range here actually um, you get an uh, you get an underestimator for the total treatment effect. But you can restrict your sample average to uh, to the units that received uh, all, all treated versus um, the, the units received all control here. This is un, this is unbiased because you are, you are basically the first the, the expectation for the first term here is basically uh, the right hand side and the expectation over the second term here is the left hand side so you will get an unbiased estimator but you will definitely get a large variance because if you compare the sample size for this estimator it would be much more smaller than counting uh, all the treated and all, all the control and that's a problem for the uh, non-parametric estimators of course um, people usually consider per, um, parametric models so we can we can consider parametric models as an extrapolation through regressions because you got points in the middle range, and what you want to estimate is the, the difference between the two extremes. So one commonly used model is like the, the linear regression model, uh, with respect to its own treatment status and uh, some summary statistics uh, from its neighbors. This model is simple. But, but it may have a large bias if the model is, uh, if it is misspecified. So the performance is only guaranteed if the true model is like in this kind of form. So if we have a kind of nonlinear relationship based on the summary statistics, or we, we depends on a higher degree of, of interactions, then, then this kind of linear model will definitely fail in that case. Therefore, in, in this talk, um, the authors consider this kind of a truncated interactions. Actually, it has more parameters here. In case it's more capable than just a single simple linear regression model, when, when considering uh, the flexibility in, in representing the potential outcome. So it's, uh, in general, it has a lower risk of, of misspecification. So that, that's the reason. Uh, in the simulation part, uh, it, it was simulated as a quadratic function on the on, on a certain in the interaction terms, which falls into the, the the correct range for the truncated interactions. But for other estimators, they will have the bias. Uh, from for example, here is from the misspecification, and for the non-parametric part, it basically the bias comes from the the inclusion for the units in the middle part. So here's uh, my few questions on, on the pseudo inverse estimator. Actually, the, the first is, uh, actually the first and the second are, are connected. So uh, I'm just wondering what's the consequences if we kind of uh, over specify or under specify the order beta there. So probably over specify is uh, not such a big deal but may, it may have a bias if we under uh, specify the order beta. And the question naturally is the de determination of the beta. But 
it is a regression problem and it is not exactly a regression problem because uh, from from the author's formula actually it, it's a regression from a few different data sets so for each unit i it has a, its own regression problem so it's like uh, uh, it's like if you group the group the design matrix group the uh, covariates in a regression by their order it's a kind of uh, the different problems are connected through uh, their order of uh, the, their order of interactions beta. So it's like a, a few parallel uh, connected, but uh, kind of relatively independent uh, regression problem. So I'm not sure if there's any way to determine uh, the, the order here, but there, that may be an open question here. And for the last one, since uh, the, the estimate is unbiased, and uh, it also has certain uh, property on its variance. So my initial question is, uh, is this estimator achieve the smallest variance among all the unbiased estimators? So whether it is a, a, a UMVOE in some sense. So yeah, and uh, that's all my discussion and questions. Uh, thank you, Zheng Zheng. If you can keep your questions up to make oh, sure Christina has them. Uh, if you would you like to take a few moments, a few minutes, Christina, to respond to some of these questions or comments. Sure. Um, so I think indeed uh, determining the value of beta is is probably the the most interesting, like practically relevant um, question, I think, if you want to really figure out the, the use of our method in practice. Um, I think that on one hand, um, it might feel that over-specifying is less costly than under-specifying because then you don't run into, you know, misspecification, or as in, as in, uh, you allow yourself to be more flexible. But actually, the limitation is that the variance bound we showed that scales exponentially in beta, uh, it, it scales exponentially in the value of beta that you choose to in, to use in your estimator, mm -hmm. not the value of beta that is the true that governs the true model complexity. So. If the true model is only linear, but you use beta equals like five, you'll yeah. have actually um, an exponential dependence on the beta that you choose. Mm -hmm. So it's, I actually hesitate to say that that's what you should do if you, you know, practically, or because, so again, we basically, the choice of beta, it does translate into a bias variance trade off, but yeah. the variance part of it scales exponentially in beta. And mm -hmm. the bias part is presumably bounded if my potential outcomes are bounded. Yeah. Um, so it, the trade-off is actually more tricky than that because uh, if you just overestimate a little bit, um, you you know you, you could kick up your mean squared error by a lot. Um, and so that's what we found. It, I mean, empirically, if you notice, we only showed uh, beta equals one beta equals, and beta equals two because we were doing pretty small instances where and and if we chose larger values of beta, we we needed much larger instances in order to drive the variance down. Uh, because we really need like the sample size to scale exponentially in beta. Yeah. So, um, so actually, if I were to um, realistically, practically use the estimator, I would actually use the beta equals one estimator. <laughs> um, in right. fact, right now, empirically, um, linear regression is always done with, you know, uh, in, in, I feel like the most mm, common pra uh, practical estimator that's used is the OLS or linear regression based estimators. But the limitation for those is that they require uh, this homogeneity that the model, uh, the model actually um, uh, cannot, you know, you're fitting like one linear model for, you know, certain covariate, a specified covariate. And our, and even when beta equals one, our model is already more flexible than other linear models because it allows yeah. for heterogeneity coefficients. So actually in the experiments, um, the, the model, the bias for the OLS was not coming from the fact that we're choosing the wrong beta. We did generalize OLS to larger values of uh, beta, but the, the the bias actually comes from assuming homogeneity as opposed to allowing for heterogeneity in mm -hmm. the coefficients. Um, we don't know if, it, I, I don't think it's the uniform minimum variance unbiased estimator. Um, the best I, I can, I, we know, which is what I showed is really showing optimality looking at the mean squared error. Mm -hmm. um, so at least we know the scaling in terms of the scaling of the variance in a particular regime, you know, we're not too off. But um, uh, yeah, but I, 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 I would not, yeah, I wouldn't claim that as you and VV. Sure. Is there any other uh, Q&A questions there? Uh, 
Right, so I guess like there is one question that we can take before we close that just showed up in Q&A. Uh, what would change if the causal regression model would be non-linear and non-polynomial? I think that's a question for Christina. Mm, um, that's a good question. Um, I do think that, so what our model assumes really is um, uh, low degree interactions, but if you have like, high degree, so it's not a low degree polynomial, um, but it's nonlinear. And it, it, I think the, the works that I've seen have looked at, um, uh, say, using non-parametric regression, where maybe I'm not imposing a very strong functional form, but I do assume anonymous interference. I think that you end up trading off one type of assumption for another. So as in, uh, uh, you need to assume some kind of homogeneity that like, maybe I maybe it's a functional of the number of treated individuals, but that functional itself is non-parametric. Um, that would be a class of models that our model cannot capture, but it also doesn't capture ours. So it's, it's in neither are more expressive than the other. Okay, thank you. I think this is a, a great time to wrap up. Um, so I'm going to really quickly uh, remind you that we have an online Catholic for seminar next week. Uh, we will have Sofia Tredafilo from the University of Crete to talk to us about a Bayesian method for causal effect estimation with observational and experimental data. Thank you both, uh, Christina and Cheng Cheng, for a great talk and discussion. Um, and if you would like to uh, stick around, there's one more question on the Q&A, but uh, we're already over time, so I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>